who's giving a talk tomorrow morning? From which company? YouTube. Check it out. If you can't find it, I'll give you one more word and one match. Um, OK, so <laughs> all right, you're welcome anytime. Um, so I, I am not talking about lawyer stuff, but so I want to talk to you about copyrights, and patents, and licenses. And it's really quite, quite a minefield. So I'm going to start with this. Do you know what this stands for? Who knows what this stands for? OK, after 24 hours, that's not a fair question, I guess. It's, it stands for, I am not a lawyer. Right? That's a very common thing you see when people talk about software stuff in open source community and so forth. People give lots of opinions. They start with IANAL, but, but here's what I think anyway. Right? So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm going to tell you what I understand and believe about copyright, patents, and licenses, and how it applies to, to engineers. So, so let me just, uh, I, I'm going to try not to take too long, so I'll, I'll uh, uh, go through this. So uh, first of all, the concept of copyright. So the idea of, of uh, so there's some definition, right? So, so, so the idea is if you create something, anything, if you write a, on a, take a piece of paper and write your name on it, that uh, is copyright your, you. If you write a story on it, that is your copyrighted work. If you draw a picture, that's your copyrighted work. If you write a poem, it's copyrighted work. If you write a piece of Java code on a piece of paper, that's your copyrighted work. Right? What that means is you own it, right? When, when you own something, um, you know, as the owner of something, of course, you can give it to somebody else. Right? So, so that, that's the part about a, a, uh, that's where licensing comes in. So when you own something, you can give it to somebody else, and you can give it to different people under different terms. So I can decide I want to give these two ladies my drawing and say you can use it free of charge. Right? I want to give, uh, give this guy over here and say, you know what, if you want, to, here's my drawing, but you must pay me 10 rupees if you want to use it. Right? I own it, so I can do that. Completely legal, completely legitimate. Right? You can discriminate on who you give what and what terms and so forth. And that's as a copyright owner, that's, the, that's the, the power of the copyright owner because it's your property right, that you're giving in some form. And then you can decide to give it to one person under certain terms, give it to another person under certain terms. Um, and, and when you give it like that, the copyright itself does never transfers. Unless you explicitly transfer the copyright to somebody else by signing some legal thing saying or writing an agreement saying hereby I transfer my copyright over to you, it never transfers. So it is always your thing. Right? Now, copyright is a, is a concept that's very old. Uh, it's been around for uh, quite a while. And, and also, by the way, it times out. So the idea is that, uh, uh, so if you go to, um, uh, who's, who, who's heard of a project called Project Gutenberg? Yes? Yeah, you know what it is, right? Guten, Gutenberg was the guy who invented the printing press. Project Gutenberg is a, is a, uh, is a, a project that's scanning books that have expired copyrights, basically. So when you write a book, there's a copyright, so you can't take a book and photocopy it. I know a lot of us do that. I've done it as a, as a student. And a lot of people do that. Uh, but you can't legally do that. And in fact, you can't even take a book and photocopy a chapter and give it away to people. Right? There is something called fair use, which is if you are teaching a class and you are taking a picture from a book and you are sharing it to everybody, that is considered fair use. And then that's legally allowed. But if you go beyond that, if I take a, cop a book, I buy a book, I photocopy it, and I sell it, that's illegal, right? Because the author doesn't get any money out of it. If, if you write a book and you sell it, you usually get a very small percentage, about 10% of the, the selling price goes to the author, right? Uh, but if you just do it yourself, you don't get it, right? So, so but copyrights do expire, okay? And, and if you want to, uh, 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 but, but there, there's also, a, a, a lot of stuff that's been done over time to prevent expiry, especially in US, because of Disney, right? So you know the Mickey Mouse? Right? Mickey Mouse was copyrighted like 1910 or something like that. So US default is 25 years. So uh, Disney has so much power that they managed to get the US rules changed every time it was coming up for this thing to keep extending the copyright, right? So, so, so there's actually a, 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 there's a very interesting uh, presentation about this, uh, and I can give you a link to it if you're interested. Uh, so, so copyright is a very, very important thing to understand because it means you can't just take other people's stuff, right? And stuff doesn't mean physical stuff. Stuff means anything they write down on a piece of paper. 
If somebody writes, you go and ask somebody saying, Machang, how do I do this? And they write it down and they give it to you and you go and type it in, you just violated copyright. Right? And that's, that's it. You violated copyright. There's no negotiation. Okay, so then there's something, a, a, uh, but of course, you don't always want to protect everything. Sometimes you want people to use stuff, right? So there is a place called Creative Commons, and I have a video, I'm gonna play that in one second, not yet. Uh, a, a creative Commons is a, uh, is a way of sharing content, and uh, uh, mostly creative kind of content, not like programming kind of content, but for creative kind of content, and I'll talk about the difference, uh, so other people can use it. Uh, there's a very nice three minute video from their website, so I'm just gonna ask these guys to play it, please. When you share your creativity, you're enabling people anywhere to use it, learn from it, and be inspired by it. Take the teacher who shapes young minds with work and wisdom from around the globe and the artist who builds beauty out of bits and pieces she finds online, and the writer whose stories use ideas and images crafted by people you've never even met. These people know that when you share your creative wealth, you can accomplish great things. They and millions of other people all around the planet are working together to build a richer, better, more vibrant culture using creative commons. To understand Creative Commons, you need to know a little bit about how copyright works. Did you know that when you create something, anything, from a photograph, to a song, to a drawing, to a film, to a story, you automatically own an all rights reserved copyright to that creativity? It's true. Copyright protects your creativity against uses you don't consent to. But sometimes full copyright is too restrictive. What about when you want all those millions and millions of people out there to use your work without the hassle of coming to you for permission? What if you want your work to be freely shared, reused, and built upon by the rest of the world? Luckily, there's an answer. Creative Commons. We provide free copyright licenses you can use to tell people exactly which parts of your copyright you're happy to give to the public. It's easy. It only takes a minute, and it's totally free. Just come to our website and answer a few quick questions like, will you allow commercial uses of your work? And will you allow your work to be modified? Based on your answers, we'll give you a license that clearly communicates what people can and can't do with your creativity. You don't give up your copyright. You refine it so it works better for you. Welcome to a new world where collaboration rules. It didn't even exist just a few years ago, but now there are millions and millions of songs, pictures, videos, and written works available to share, reuse, and remix, all for free. Want to work together? Then join the Commons, Creative Commons. So Creative Commons basically has a set of licenses that let you decide what are the conditions under which you want people to be able to use a piece of creative content you've done. And then you can, when you publish that work, you say this is available under Creative Commons attribution only license, which basically means anybody can use it, they must say they got something from you. Right? Or you can say attribution only no, non-commercial use. And there's a whole combination of things like that. Right? So you can decide how much uh, of your rights you want to give away and just put it out. And so it's very, very useful way of doing something without having to involve a lawyer, without having to ask all these questions saying, how do I give this kind of access but not that kind of access because if somebody else is making money off of it, I want to get paid for it, which is a very reasonable kind of, so, so you can put something out and say non-commercial use is allowed, <coughs> right? So that's, that's a very, very quick and high level view of copyright. Now let me talk about patents. So a, a patent is, a, or a patent depending on which country you're speaking from, um, is really a, a, a grant, a registration of some work you've done with an authority, with the government, in effect, saying that you own this thing, right? whatever that thing is. And it's really designed to give somebody who creates something, an inventor, a time to cash in on it. So if you invent a, a better gear for a bicycle, right, and you write it up and you publish an article about it, if a bicycle manufacturer takes it and produces it and puts it into their bike and sells their bicycles, 
they're going to have a competitive edge and they make some money out of it. But you invented it, right? So if, they, if there's no way to protect that, they can just take your idea and just copy it and be done with it. So uh, uh, if it's patented, you can't do that. It's illegal, right? So if it's patented, that means the patent owner has to grant a license of some sort for you to uh, uh, do something with it. So you have to go and get, uh, get approval from that person, right? Uh, and, and that means you must do some kind of a business transaction. Uh, patent licensing is a huge business for many companies. So IBM, for example, makes multiple billion dollars every year on licensing their software patents. Their patents, all kinds of patents. They have everything from physical stuff to software and so forth, right? Um, and and so, so the, the, the objective is to give somebody, again, some time, it does expire, uh, some time to capitalize on it. Uh, when you file a patent, you are required to write down exactly how to implement whatever that thing is. So if you have a patent, so recently, a, uh, everybody knows about the Tesla is, right? Tesla is an electric car done by Elon Musk. Uh, it's a fantastic car. Tesla decided they're open sourcing, opening up all their patents. They said all their patents are freely available because they want the electric car, pure electric car industry to take off. So they opened up a whole bunch of their patents. Uh, now, wh uh, what that has done is instead of somebody who, so Tesla had all kinds of patents on how to charge a battery, how to manage the battery temperature, how to you know, sustain, because they are the only car that can do about a 300 mile distance on a single charge, right? So, so it's like filling up your gas petrol tank, right? You fill up the petrol tank, you get about 200 to 300 miles on that, uh, on that tank. So battery is at that level with Tesla. Uh, so all of that knowledge is now openly available for anybody to use. Before, if somebody else wanted to make a car that had the same kind of capability, they would have to go and uh, <coughs> get a license from them. Because if not, even if they come up with the same thing, because that process that approach is patented, you can't just go and do it, right? So that's an important aspect of patents. That is, even if you independently invent the same thing, you cannot say, oh, I came up with the same idea, I'm just gonna go off and do it. You can't do that, right? Now, and there are uh, different countries have different rules. There's this concept of first to file and first to invent. First to file means if you come up with an idea, you need to get it registered in the patent office first. If two people come up with the same idea, it doesn't matter who came up with it first, whoever files it first gets a patent, right? First to invent means you must prove that you first invented it on this date, and then the patent is effective that day. So if somebody else says, they, no, no, we had invented the same concept five years before that, it gets violated, it gets uh, nullified, right? So, um, uh, physic so pa patents, of course, were invented before intellectual stuff started getting patented. Uh, in, in the, uh, I, think, I think in the 80s, software started becoming patentable, right? And, and the, the thing with software patents is that uh, it's a really, uh, it's a very simple thing to patent. You just write up saying this particular way of doing software is now patented. This is an example patent that I actually wrote up when I was in IBM. Um, and this was, you can look it up, it's, a, it's, it's called a type converter registry patent. It, it basically says if you're trying to, if you write code that says I want to convert some type from another type and you look it up in a registry, that approach for doing it is patented and owned by IBM. It's now expired, it expired in 2010 and they didn't renew it and so forth. But a, a, so there's all kinds of patents for software. Pretty much anything you think about saying, you know, you think, oh, I got a cool way to do something. If you look for it, it'll be patented, right? So, so because, you know, people have thought of all kinds of stuff and, and you are just, people are filing it away because when you file a patent, uh, you can control other people. I'll get to that in a second, right? So, um, so the problem with software patents is that it's actually very expensive to file a software patent because you have to write it up, you need to defend it, you gotta you got go through a whole process. And it's something that, yes, you can do, but it takes quite a bit of effort, so it's not something a lot of people do. The catch, though, is because large companies do this a lot, uh, if you want to shut down a small company, the best way is send them a thousand patents and say, you guys are violating all of our patents, please pay up. Right, and, and if you don't, and, and then you have to, if you don't, you get taken to court. So uh, the reality is if you get a cent a thousand patents, you need to get a lawyer to analyze this thousand patents. That's gonna cost a lot of money. And so most companies then say, okay, how much do you want us to pay, and they negotiate. In fact, there's a business model for that. It's called patent troll companies, right? There are companies whose business is go and buy patents from other people and go sue people for money. 
When they sue people, they get money. That's their revenue model, right? They're called patent trolls. There's, in fact, a venture firm called Intellectual Ventures who invests, like uh, Prajit was saying, who invests in patent troll companies, right? Because it's a perfectly legit, you know, viable business. You, you buy IP from somebody. Remember Google bought uh, Motorola phone division, right? How much did they pay, do you remember? Six billion, 11 billion, something like that, right? 11 or 12 billion, if I remember right. What they really bought was not the ability to make phones. Right? You know, making phones is dime a dozen. All the Chinese guys are doing it in various forms. It's not a major deal, actually making it. The hard part is designing the software, designing the creative parts, and so forth. They were not really interested in a phone manufacturing thing. What they bought was, uh, I can't remember the exact number, like 5,000 patents in the mobile space, right? And Google bought them not necessarily to enforce the patents against other people, but to defend themselves. Because they knew Apple is going to sue them. So you go, ah, you can't make that thing turn around leftward because we have patented that. You know, Apple has patented all the finger movements on top of a phone, right? So if you give the finger, to, wrong finger, finger to the phone, <laughs> Apple's got a patent on it. Right, you're violating Apple's patent. So Google has to say, ah, ah downward, not upward now. Because they got the other direction going. So, a, a, so by having a lot of patents in your hand, when somebody else threatens you, you can threaten them right back. Say, so, oh, great, I got a thousand of mine too that I can wave in front of you. So what, the way it works in the software industry, because if you, if you just start suing each other, IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, Apple, Google, Amazon will spend their entire time and money in court suing each other. So what they do, all the big companies do is SAP, Software Edge, all these companies, they sign what's called cross-licensing agreements. Right? There's something saying, hey, we won't sue you if you won't sue us. Like, Great, right? Because you know, they're, not, they're not licensing stuff from each other anyway, right? because they're competing. So they're not licensing any content from anybody. So they just say, let's not sue each other. Let's just go after all those other little guys who are painful to all of us. Right? This is a very anti-competitive behavior. It's something that can really cause a lot of problems and, and cause a, a major issues for, um, uh, uh, for small companies in particular. Because if you're a small company, you can just throw a bunch of patents at them and just shut it down. Right? Shut it down or, or force them to pay or you know, do all kinds of stuff that small companies uh, cannot do, uh, they cannot handle. So, so that, that is actually one good reason to file patents as a defensive measure. So when somebody does try to sue you, you can say, oh, well, well, I got one too, right? Well, if you got only one and they're showing 100 or 1,000 of them, that's not a very good weapon. So you need to have a few, uh, at least a few, so you can say, well, I got something, so then you try to trade. And the objective is you don't want to end up in court because if you end up in court, you're trying to prove that this patent doesn't apply, right? If you look up any patent, just read the stuff in any patent, the way it's written, it takes you months to figure out what the hell is this is trying to say and what it applies to. And then to prove that it doesn't apply, right, it's, it's a standard thing about it. it's much easier to prove something applies versus doesn't apply. Right? Or you have to find what's called prior art. Right? So, so there's actually something called EFF, Electronic Freedom Foundation, which you see sometimes, it's not, not that much anymore because now Google will help you find all prior art. Before the internet was so pervasive, uh, they would help, so some big company will go and sue some small company because they're violating some patent. And, and it's obvious this bloody patent is not like a real patent in the sense that it's been known how to do this for 50 years or for 40 years. It was in some Don Knuth book back in the 1960s or whatever. So then you have to go find that thing and go to the patent office or go to the judge and show that there is what's called prior art. So yes, this guy claims he invented it in 1994, but look, in 1983, somebody wrote a research paper that says the same thing, right? So patent is nullified. So there was EFF, you would ask people saying, hey, you're working in this space, do you know of any prior art in this space if, to help this patent thing out? So now it's, it's a lot less, you know, you can just Google it up and find it. So, so software patents, um, uh, so people file software patents for a reason, but really, you don't need software patents at all. Because if you write some code, it's copyrighted under, co it's protected under copyright law already. Right? Because that code is yours. And so somebody else can't just take your source code and copy it. That's illegal under copyright law. But people, so, so, uh, 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 so patenting is not done to protect the investment, which was the original intent of patenting, which is somebody creates something, give them a chance to make some money out of it, right? Is give them some time. That's not the reason patenting is done now. It's primarily to prevent others from doing the same thing, right? 
So uh, people just think of Microsoft as the, the anti, you know, uh, the bad guy in, in the world. And Microsoft also did all kinds of stuff. They patented keyboards. They patented keystrokes. Remember, OpenOffice uh, was in trouble because they were following the same keystrokes that Office was following and so forth. Um, but, a, 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 but really, everybody does that, right? Every big software company patents stuff. And their objective is just not, not, uh, not allow somebody else to, be comp to come up and compete against them. So it's really anti-competitive behavior. Right? Uh, or else you can say, hey, pay me money and you can have that patent. But if you are, if a competitor, if a fundamental competitor comes, if Google were to go to, uh, sorry, if Microsoft were to Google, saying, can we please license your search patents for your search engine? They're not going to give it, right? You know, that would be stupid. Of course, they're not going to give it. So, so that's an example where, that's an extreme example where you won't license it to anybody. You will only license it to people that you want to license it to. You don't have to license it to everybody, right? So that's patents. So I'm d almost done my third part, licenses. So license is, is a, a way of giving permission for somebody to do something with something you have or something you own, right? So, so uh, if you own um, copyright on some software or a picture or whatever, you can grant a license to somebody else saying you can use it under these terms. Uh, there are hundreds of software licenses that have been created uh, and, uh, and the entire concept of open source, free and open source software is powered by licenses. So free and open source software primarily has a few principles that are required to be followed if you are uh, distributing software under those terms. One key principle is you cannot discriminate. Earlier I was saying I'm going to give my picture to these two people, they can use it free, this guy had to pay money, right? Not possible with, uh, if it's under free and open source software license. The, so you can't say, hey, I'm writing this software, I don't want anybody using my software to kill people. Can't do that, right? So, you know, Al-Qaeda or, or ISIS or whatever can take WS2 software and write a program that blows people up. You can't do anything about it. It's under Apache license, it means you can do anything about it. You can do that if you want. Right? Um, a, a, you, there are a bunch of other things like, so, so depending on the kind of license, there are all kinds of implications. But licenses are what drives the entire movement of free software. So there are two fundamental kinds of licenses that, that are interesting, copyleft and copyright licenses. Copyleft licenses are saying, let me just give it all away, but have some constraints on how people consume it. Right? And primarily, it's, it's, uh, these are also called viral licenses. The, the idea is that, I want to say, I'm giving you a gift, and because I gave you a gift, it must always be a gift, right? So, so that's the fundamental difference between copyleft licenses and copyright. So GPL, the GNU public license, which is the most, uh, GNU general public license, which is most widely known, is basically saying, hey, you can take any software, completely free, you can do whatever you want, but if you improve the software, if you add something to it, extend it, add a feature, and you distribute it, it must be under the same license. So it's called viral because once you catch it, it's gonna keep on going, right? But if you don't distribute it, you don't have to follow the license. So there's no distribution, so there's no license because there's no distribution involved, right? So that's how Google uses a whole bunch of GPL software, such as MySQL, such as Linux, and they do all kinds of modifications. But because Google is not a software company, it doesn't matter, right? You can't download source code of a uh, product from Google. Right? There is no product you download from Google. You just go to google.com and use their software. Because it's only a cloud service, no issue. Right? So to fix that, these guys created something called AGPL, a Faro GPL, a Faro GPL, which says, no, 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 if you host it and offer a service on the net, that's considered distribution. Because Google doesn't touch AGPL stuff. If you go to Google, Google code and try to do an open source project, you cannot have an AGPL license uh, project there. They won't allow it. Right? So the other kind is copyright licenses. Copyright licenses are, are kind of the, the opposite, which is saying, hey, you can take my stuff, do whatever you want with it, right? So, so the most uh, popular one is Apache license, which, which essentially says uh, you can take this source code, you can build an extension of it, you can add stuff to it, you can build a proprietary product on top of this, do whatever you want. There is a notice requirement. Somewhere you must say that it is coming from some Apache license code underneath. But other than that, there's no constraints and do whatever you want, right? So it's, it's a lot more flexible. Um, one, one last statement about license. There's also this concept of EULA that you see all the time. You know, when you buy some software and you install it or you install your operating system, you get this big old thing and you say, I accept, right, or I agree. I'm sure none of you read it, which is, which is completely normal. 
unless you're a lawyer, in which case you read. I do know somebody who actually reads every one of those bloody words in there. Uh, but uh, you have no choice, right? You just bought the software. Oh, you want to use the software? Just agree to this. Uh, you paid $200 or $50 or $100 or whatever. You must agree to it. And, and if you actually look at what it says, it says, well, if this software eats your life and kills you, tough luck. If this software erases all your files, tough luck. If this software loses your data, tough luck. If it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is tough luck. And by the way, you don't even own it. You can only use it. That's why it's called end user license agreement. So for example, you can buy Microsoft Office, and I'm not picking on Microsoft, same is true about IBM, Oracle, SAP, every company is software, proprietary software. You can buy Microsoft Office, use it for a year, you can say, oh, why don't I sell my thing? You can't do that. Right? You don't have the right to sell it anymore. Right? It's not yours. You have a license to use it. Your license is not transferable. You can't transfer your user license. That's why when you buy an OEM PC, even though it comes with a Windows license, if it comes with a Windows license, if you say, well, I'm going to buy another PC, you can't use that license on this PC. That was license for this PC. If this PC goes into the trash can, so does the license. Right? So that's how, that's how uh, EULAS works. So EULAS is also an important thing to understand. Um, so it's just a right to use thing. So finally, in summary, so, so uh, if you're a programmer, you can't take this stuff for granted. Why? Because of simple things like, hey, if you, if you just go to, you read, somebody writes a blog, right, and says, here's a cool bit of code I wrote to do something. We all do that, right? Look at other people's blog about code fragments. If you take that code fragment and put it into something you're working on, unless that person has explicitly put the code under a particular license or said something about it, you're violating the guy's copyright, right? That fragment of code is copyright by that person. Remember this recent uh, case by Oracle against Java for Android? Sorry, Oracle against Google for Android, yes? And who won? Oracle, right? Do you know how many lines of code were involved in that decision? No, two, if I remember right. Okay, two, seven, whatever. Very small number, that's it. They were granted, I don't know how many millions of dollars or billions of dollars, but they won a case saying Android is violating Java licenses because some programmer made the mistake of copying a couple of lines of code from one place to another place. Right. Now, recently there was an even more scary thing that was uh, given to Oracle, which is they were granted, uh, they, they won a case saying APIs are copyrighted. That's a serious problem. If that thing holds, that breaks a whole bunch of stuff. It just says, if you take a Java X dot, uh, XML dot whatever API, you can't implement it without their approval. They own the copyright on the API. Right. So that's a huge problem. That will hopefully not last. Um, so so uh, uh, the most important thing, you cannot, even textbooks, by the way, right, unless the textbook, uh, unless the Java book, your favorite Java book, look and see what it says in the front about the code that's in the book. If it doesn't explicitly say this code is available for people to use either under Creative Commons license or whatever the approach, you're violating their copyright if you just copy it and put it in your in the application you're ready, right? So it's a very serious thing. And uh, you know, Google lost a multi-million or multi-billion dollar case just on a few lines of code. So yes, if you copy it and put it into something, 99% you know, probability you will not get into problems. But there is that one chance if your thing becomes a big thing like Android became, you could be in a lot of trouble. So you don't do that. Uh, if, uh, and also, if you, the other part of the question is download stuff, right? We all download third party libraries, especially JavaScript guys are terrible at this. You pick up 17 random JavaScript libraries from all kinds of places. Yes. And, and, and the catch is you have to look at the license. You can't just do it, right? Uh, every one of them have a license. You have to look at the license. And, and the easiest rule to follow is okay, if it's Apache license, Mozilla license, and a few well-known li Berkeley license, no problem, absolutely no issue. GPL, uh, people don't really put JavaScript on a GPL usually, but you could. GPL is also probably okay for that scenario. Uh, but uh, so, so without looking at the license, you are potentially violating somebody's property, right? So you can't do that. So you have to be very, very careful when you download some library and, and use it, right? Or you can look for what's called public domain software. Public domain m is a statement of copyright. So copyright is a statement of ownership, it's mine. Right, or it's, it's hers, or it's yours. Public domain means I say, hey, it's nobody's, it's everybody's. Right? And the owner of copyright can explicitly put something into the public domain by asserting that I am here by putting my picture into the public domain. So all my art is public domain, because nobody wants to use my art, that's the main reason. 
So um, patents, so I, I am pretty much anything you guys have written this weekend, if you look enough, there will be patents you violated, right? The rule is don't go freaking look, right? If you are knowingly violating the law, that's very bad because you know you're violating the law. If you make a mistake, you ask for forgiveness. Oh shit, you had it patented? I didn't know that. Okay, you can have that bit out, I'll rewrite that. Right, so don't go look for patents or patented stuff because it's you're asking for unnecessary trouble. Right, because m n again, 99% probability it's not gonna be an issue. And you're not trying to do it maliciously. I mean, if you are trying to maliciously recreate an idea of somebody else's, then yes, then most probably you'll get in trouble and you deserve it in that case. If you are incidentally, coincidentally using somebody else's stuff, if somebody has an issue with it, let them complain. Then you say, oh, no problem, I'll take it out, right? So, so that's something to be very, very careful about. But you know, all this legal mumbo jumbo doesn't mean there's no room to create stuff. There's plenty of room to create stuff. The open source movement is very, very active. There's so many different things going on. There's all kinds of things you can create. And, and the, the power of the people does rule eventually. If you, if you get enough movement going, uh, you know, it's very unlikely somebody will, will come after you. So, so don't, don't, don't feel constrained, but it's something you need to be, as a developer, you need to be aware of that this stuff is real. It's not a game. If you're working in a software company, it's absolutely not a game because that company can get sued and will get sued if you mess around with it, right? And don't ever file a single software patent if you can. All right, thank you.